Howdy, this is a short video on the Fourth Amendment and it is important to our study of cybersecurity because we are in the digital age. You hear us talk about the different amendments, the first 10 being the Bill of Rights in our Constitution. They were written in the late 19, or excuse me, 1700s. And if you know history, it's the only way they could get some signatures to uh, accept the Constitution because they wanted to have protection of rights. And you hear the meeting, you hear people banner about their first and second and fourth and fifth and sixth and 14th, you know, uh, 14th's not in the Bill of Rights, but their 14th rights, uh, 14th Amendment right. And yet many people really don't understand what the Constitution says. So let's look at the Fourth Amendment, which is important in cybersecurity and what electronic assets need to be accessed by, with a search warrant and which not. Also, always remember, the Bill of Rights does not protect you from me. It protects you from a government entity, whether it is federal, state, local, okay? The, the uh, Constitution and the uh, Supreme Court write for the federal courts or the federal police or, uh, excuse me, the federal government. However, under the 14th Amendment, all of these same rights flow down to state and local governments. So. There's nothing that says, hey, federal government can't do this, but the state government can. But there are things that the federal government can't do that a private entity can do. And that's, that's a whole other discussion. So let's look at the wording. The right of the people to be secure in their persons, houses, papers, and effects against unreasonable searches and seizures shall not be violated and no warrant shall issue but put upon probable cause. Okay, let's go back. Papers and effects. Hmm, this was written in the late 1700s when all business was done on paper uh, at, at a great expense, right? Handwritten and effects. So they were talking about physical objects, but the court has looked at this and said, no, this is also true in the digital world. So a paper, but you know, a document, email, some things like that. Some extends and some doesn't, okay? Against unreasonable searches and seizures. Well, if somebody could give me a great definition of unreasonable, please do, because it's a moving target. It's, uh, we've seen a move towards more privacy in Supreme Court decisions lately. In uh, criminal law, we see a move against privacy and security in, in, uh, for personal. Uh, Fourth Amendment is typically criminal, of course, because it's talking about warrants. But that definition of unreasonable, there's, well, there's not a definition. What's unreasonable to you may not be unreasonable to me. What's unreasonable to me as a public citizen uh, who's about to have my car searched may not be unreasonable to a policeman with 20 years experience or a district attorney or a judge. So a lot of your cases go, hey, it was unreasonable. I had an expectation of privacy, big words. So your rights not gonna be violated. <clears throat> and these rights extend to anyone in the US. If you're here legally, illegally, resident, student on a visa, tourist, permanent resident, citizen, what have you. Now, I know what you're thinking. There's a lot going on at the border right now, and you hear people say, well, there's constitutional rights and this and that. I'm going to sidestep that issue. There are exceptions to the Fourth Amendment, and one exception is you do not have Fourth Amendment rights at the border when you enter the country in the interest of national security. So you're coming through customs, and they want to search your bags, and you say, well, do you have a warrant? They're just going to look at you. Uh, no, we don't need a warrant, right? Uh, this has been taken to extreme. Uh, several years ago, there was a court case where they had a van in Kansas and the court ruled the border exception. The van had come over the border from Mexico full of drugs. And even though it was like 36 hours after it had come in, the court successfully, or the prosecution successfully argued for the uh, border exception, which to me seems uh, a little bit extreme. But there are exceptions. There are also exceptions in emergency situations. Uh, you know, if you think someone's in danger, if you think this, if you think that. But all of these have to be backed up with true belief. You can't just say, hey, I thought I heard somebody scream, so I broke into the room and found, you know, da, da, da. Uh, so that's the first part. Unreasonable searches and seizures. What does it affect? Now let's look at the warrants. There has to be a warrant. It has to be based on probable cause, which is another poorly defined term. It's not a legal standard. It says, did you have sufficient knowledge? But what is that sufficient knowledge? And 
um, did you did you believe this? You know, I just say, hey, my friend across the streets made me mad. So, hey, I'm going to call 911 and say they have drugs and the police are going to come and say, oh, we need a search warrant. Well, somebody called in. No, did you did you have knowledge? Because what you have to see here is supported by oath or affirmation. Those search warrants, the requester must, under threat of perjury, sign for that. And then it goes to a judge and the judge grants or does not grant it. So there is a legal process here. The next part of the Fourth Amendment is particularly describing the place to be searched. Wow, what happened in the late 1700s is so much different than you're gonna describe the place to be searched as a physical place, but now I have my smartphone. Does this mean I have to compel you to give up my password uh, to open my smartphone? So you have to particularly describe the place to be searched. You've seen this on Law and Order or, or police shows where uh, oh wait, the search warrant was for the house, but they looked in the car. The search warrant was for the house, but they looked in the garage. There was a case lately that uh, the person had a rental car and the Supreme Court ruled that uh, the warrant didn't hold because the person's name wasn't on the legal uh, document renting the car or something. It was one of those, uh, wow, that's, that's not gonna happen. I wouldn't count on that. So we have papers and effects. How does that translate in the electronic age? Unreasonable searches and seizures. The unreasonable standard has changed over time. These are rights. You have these rights, and we need to be educated on our rights to protect our rights. And you have to have a search warrant. You have to have probable cause at each step. You have to have an oath or affirmation, someone willing to say, I, I truly believe this is something illegal going on here. I'm going to put my name, I'm gonna sign my name, put my right hand up and swear it's true. And that search warrant has to particularly describe the place to be searched. So, ding, 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 your head should be going off in, uh, all right, go back to the case in San Bernardino where they couldn't account for 18 minutes of the terrorist um, activities after they had shot and killed a number of people they uh, wanted access to the phone. Uh, they, there was no way to get access. They wanted Apple to uh, provide them with the technical help that may or may not have worked to break the code on the phone because it was set up that after every 10 tries of a, of a, uh, a technique to try to hack against the password, everything was erased. So the, the algorithm didn't know if something had already been tried. Uh, you have cases like that. And one of the most important cases came out a few weeks ago on the Carpenter opinion. So let me switch here. And first of all, if you want to see the Carpenter opinion, you don't have anything else to do. This is not the opinion. This is the um, oral arguments and the like uh, when it was filed. But you can see how lengthy this is and how verbose and how, you know, oh my gosh, it's all that stuff that lawyers love especially if they're getting paid by the hour. Um, but if you want to get the opinion, Google it. If you, want to, if you want to see the actual Supreme Court decision, even in law school, you very rarely read an entire Supreme Court decision. They're long, they're voluminous, they go into the background, they do all the law. You get to the part where here's what happened, you get to the part where it's like, here's our decision. All right, so I just pulled this up on Google, understanding this Supreme Court's Carpenter's decision. This is completely important to you. Okay, because the longstanding precedent has been any data I share with a third party is not subject to requiring a search warrant. Well, what data do I share with a third party? All my bank transactions, my phone logs, meaning who I called, how long the call lasted, not the content of the phone call. You know, I can do a social network, a graph based on uh, who someone called, how long they talked, how frequently they talked. Uh, I don't need to know the content to infer some uh, activity, um, some, something's going on. So the, the, the Carpenter decision had been looked at since uh, last fall. The crime actually occurred seven or eight years ago. The technology it was ruling on, and, and let's, let's go back to our very first lecture. There's technical, there's technology, and then there's a the law. The technology it was ruling for is now pretty much obsolete. It was seven or eight years ago. It doesn't matter. The rule of law comes down. And in Carpenter's case, uh, he was arrested for some uh, robberies at cell phone companies. And every time they pinged where his phone had been, he had been in the vicinity of the robberies. Now, did he do it? 
Probably. But that's the great thing about the Bill of Rights. It doesn't matter if someone's guilty or not guilty. What matters is we have to protect their rights, that the process is fair for everyone. So the court ruled uh, that the Fourth Amendment search violates a person's legitimate expectation of privacy and the rec record of his physical movements. Now, this, uh, this particular uh, website I pulled up is, um, was written within an hour, so you can go back and I, and I would urge you to Google this. Um, as, as Americans, as students living here, as, as residents, as somebody just visiting here, I think the more you know about your rights, uh, the better. Um, you can actually uh, give away your Fourth Amendment rights. You can have somebody say, hey, I think I smell something funny in your car. This happened to a friend of mine who was a prosecutor and she was very zealous, but she did the right thing. Uh, she was a prosecutor in the Atascosita County, south of Bear County, San Antonio, which, as she said, there must be a sign that says, if you're on I-35, speed or have a broken taillight and be carrying drugs. They stopped this young woman. Uh, the policeman said, I think I smell something. Do you have any pot in the car? And she said, yes. And he said, where is it? And she opened uh, a compartment in the car and said, here it is. She didn't have to do that. It's got to be in plain sight. That's why you hear on the police shows, it was it in plain sight. If he had seen it, but he didn't see it. Then this policeman said to her, do you have any more? And she said, yes. He said, where? At my house. Will you take me there? Yes. She took him in, took her to his stash. Now, my friend, who was a very uh, zealous prosecutor, had been a, a probation officer for years before she went to law school, did the right thing and didn't prosecute her, but said to me, you know, who, what are we teaching these kids that they don't know their Fourth Amendment rights? So it's an important decision. The other thing I want you to notice, it was a 5-4 decision. Doesn't matter if it's a 9-0-8-1, you know, 7-2-8-0, if uh, Gorsuch has to step aside or another justice has to uh, step aside because of a conflict. Perhaps they were part of the uh, previous court rulings. Doesn't matter. If the majority opinion by one... So this is now the law of the land, and it actually protects our privacy. This is a cool thing. Everybody thinks the court's like crazy conservative. Uh, but check this paragraph out. 5-4 decision with Chief Justice Roberts joined by the four liberal-leaning justices, and the four remaining judges dissented, all of them very conservative. They wrote their own dissents, which may explain why the opinion took so long. I love that. It's you know Ginsburg's known for the one, being the one that says, I dissent. Um, but so it's the law of the land. But what is interesting is this is a clear majority opinion. Uh, the, and, and it protects our privacy, but it's something you need to know as well. That you have a reasonable expectation of privacy, not in the contents of your cell phone. This is where this is getting uh, confused. People say, oh, so myself, no, reasonable expectation of privacy in the whole of their physical movements. The fact the cell phone was tracking where people were go. Now, let me go back. Uh, the other was Katz, and Katz is 1967. And, you know, here's the thing. These are criminal cases. So you can say, oh, my goodness, um, uh, we knew these guys were guilty. It doesn't matter. This is the United States, innocent until proven guilty. However, I also want to caution you. People will say, oh, he was found innocent. No. Out of a criminal case, you were found guilty or not guilty. Not guilty is not synonymous with innocent. If you look at the O.J. Simpson case, many believe he committed the murders. He was found not guilty, which has a beyond reasonable doubt, but in a civil case, he was found responsible for the deaths, which has a very a lower evidentiary standard. So let's go back to the Katz case, because this is an important case uh, in 1967, because this one basically established the expectation of privacy. This guy's a gambler. He's on the phone. He's doing his business. They record his phone conversations on a pay phone. They try to say, hey, it's a public pay phone. But the court said no. He went into the, the, the phone booth, which is kind of funny. Some of you may have to Google what a phone booth looked like. And he closed the door and he had an expectation of privacy. So why am I talking about this in cybersecurity law? Because many of you will do investigations. And if you do an investigation for the government, it's a lot different than doing the investigation for a private company. 
One. Two, you need to know your rights and how to protect them. So I think that's about all I'm going to say on that topic. Um, if you uh, are like me, or if you're planning to work with computers for the next, you know, 40 or 50 years until you retire, uh, you need to keep abreast of these, uh, these privacy uh, cases that are coming out. Expectation of privacy, uh, Fourth Amendment. We're going to be start talking about privacy in a few weeks. And you might be shocked to know that there is no statutory definition of privacy. By that, I mean no definition by, the, by Congress of what privacy is. It is all in Supreme Court decisions. So often we think of the Supreme Court as a bunch of old fuddy-duddies sitting back, ruling from high. These affect our lives. So if you have any questions about this email, and I will be back to you soon. Thank you.